Good afternoon. Welcome to the Pacific Region Forum on Business and Management Communication. I'm Rosalie Tung, Professor of International Business and Associate Director of the David Lab Center for International Communication. Our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Mary Yoko Brennan, who is the Jaroslawski East Asia Japan Chair of Cross-Cultural Management at the University of Victoria, and who continues to hold a visiting professor appointment at INSEAD in Fontainebleau. Professor Brennan is uniquely qualified to talk about biculturals and other cultural hybrids, as she has truly lived and experienced multiple cultural environments. Dr. Brennan was born and raised in Japan, studied in France, Spain, and the United States, and taught in the US, France, and now Canada. She has worked as a cross-cultural consultant to various Fortune 100 companies for more than a quarter of a century. Dr. Brennan's presentation will be followed by a question and answer period. Without further ado, I'll turn the podium to Mary Yoko. Thank you. So I'll try to get you all in my peripheral vision. I have people at each side of the periphery. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. And I'm going to talk today on biculturals and other cultural hybrids and how organizations can serve as kind of a crucible uh, for this new demographic in the workforce uh, in regards to leveraging skill sets that neither the biculturals know they have nor do the organizations know they have them. And so the, uh, the talk is all around really what we already know uh, about biculturals and, and then where we need to go in terms of understanding more about biculturals and what they have to offer. It's wonderful to be here on the west coast of, of Canada. Um, I've been in uh, BC for, since last July after having lived three years in France um, and before that in the Silicon Valley. Um, this is a really vibrant part of the world in terms of immigrants. Um, the U.S. West Coast being number one in the world and Canada being another uh, re receiving country, as, as we know, of, of many immigrants. And their children, obviously, then are bicultural um, and in some cases multicultural. And so the, the, the question being really who are these people, what are the issues and, and, and challenges uh, for them personally as well as for organizations. And I wonder how close I have to get to this to make it work, okay. So how many of you know this man, Carlos Ghosn? Okay, all right, let's see how much you know about him. He, he is the, at once the CEO and the president of Renault and Nissan. And he was the, the alliance manager of the Renault-Nissan alliance, which is to date the most successful alliance in the automobile industry, uh, global alliance in the automobile industry. He's a, remark a remarkable global leader, maybe the most successful global leader uh, to date. He was born, but he has certain aspects of him that are very different than what we think of in terms of a leader. One, he was born in Brazil of Lebanese parents. He trained as an engineer in France at the Grandes Ecoles. He held jobs in four different continents. He developed his reputation in Michelin's North American operations, including acquisition and integration of Uniroyal in Goodrich. He doesn't get the job um, as the top person at Michelin because it's given to a young Michelin heir. And uh, he was looked over being not, uh, so, some of the history, and I've interviewed Carlos Ghosn on a couple of occasions, once informally and once formally, right before I left France. And he kind of says that they weren't ready for uh, someone who really wasn't French which I'll get to in a moment, but many biculturals are marginals, uh, neither from here nor from there. And he felt that in part he wasn't you know, allowed to be the CEO of Michelin because it's a quintessential French company and he really wasn't fully French. Uh, he was finally hired, um, or he was hired by Schweitzer, who was the CEO of Renault. Uh, and, and he was uh, he, he was hired there because he was instrumental in turning around the Vilvorde plant uh, of Renault in Belgium, and there he he earned the name of Lacoste Killer because he 
laid off, and basically closed the plants and, and fired, uh, laid off is the kind of the nice term for that, over 2,700 employees. And he did that well and uh, without too many um, lawsuits, which is a, a big deal in the French-speaking part of the world. And so um, he became Schweitzer's number one choice to lead the Nissan-Renault alliance because he felt like he had somebody who could actually make something that looked to the automobile community as an impossible merger of two failing companies, Renault and Nissan. Nis Nissan was on the verge of bankruptcy, having lost $20 million uh, in debt. Uh, and then Gohan takes the helm of Nissan and turns it from being $20 million in debt in 1999 to becoming now the most profitable Japanese automobile company, which is saying a lot. Right? Um, and an interesting part of this this alliance story, which I won't go into in too much detail, is that uh, it was handled in a way that neither Renault nor Nissan lost their identity in their countries of origin. So again, Nissan now is the most successful Japanese automobile company, and it's not considered Renault. It's considered Nissan in Japan. So it's, it's a very positive organizational change effort that was led by someone who knew nothing about Japan culturally. So he's a, a Lebanese, born in Brazil, educated in France, and leads a very successful uh, turnaround uh, and alliance of, a, of an automobile company where he knew nothing about the context in which he was operating, nothing specific about the context. So what he did and what he is continuing to do is is something that is demanded of leaders more and more now in today's global context. Global leadership is at a crossroad because there's complexities of culture. Uh, you can think of organizations as being the global meeting ground. I mean, if, if the younger people in the audience and maybe our children would think of the internet as being the global meeting ground. Um, but those of us who, who work in, in organizations know that organizations really is where we have global teaming, virtual teaming, and it's really where uh, it, it's, it's the, the context in which we are meeting people from around the globe and having to work with people from around the globe on an ongoing daily basis. So, and th there's complexities of culture in regards to them not, the, the, fo uh, the foci of culture is not just national or ethnic, but it's also organizational, uh, differences between uh, Nissan and Renault in terms of the way the organization is run, industrial, occupational. There's also complexities of context, home, global, as well as local, multi-stakeholder, virtual, um, an example of this, I worked with an oil company, Slumberger, in France. Um, and if you think of any oil company, this really represents all the complexities I'm just talking about, in that on the rig, out in a uh, remote part of the world, in Africa or uh, in South America, you have people that are, have been chosen uh, to go there for their technological expertise. They might be geologists, they might be uh, engineers, they might be software engineers skilled at being able to manage the, the in intelligent part of the drill bit that's going into the uh, ocean floor to search for oil. It's very different skill sets occupationally. You might also have a salesperson. Uh, you might also have someone who's interfacing with the local government. Um, all here on the rig, you see. Some people might be from France with Schlumberger. You might have other local people. Um, all there in a remote spot, having to deal with multiple stakeholders, people that maybe are from a university, people that are from Schlumberger, people that are from the local government, people from environmental groups, et cetera, et cetera. So think of the complexities of the cultural front in which people need to understand how to work together. In terms of technologies, uh, based in, in most organizations these days, the playing field is about knowledge-based technologies, and the knowledge base is constantly changing. So that you could think of is also a cultural venue. 
um, what one person knows versus what other people know about technologies. We know that if we're a Mac user and we're in an environment where nobody uses Macs, you know, that's a cultural problem um, as much as anything else. So these new contexts and, and culture being at a crossroad is giving demands in terms of objectives on talent ma management as well. New ad objectives for the multinational, there's a shift from the transfer of single multinational know-how uh, from the home context to working in various and changing stakeholders with multiple contexts, leveraging knowledge from the periphery, meaning from the subsidiary, to reinvigorate the core. So many companies that are from, especially companies that are from smaller countries, we can't identify with that that much in Canada or in North America, but if you're a company from the UK, recently I worked with Tesco, which is the third largest food retailer in the world, um, or with Heineken uh, and from Holland. These are companies that are from small countries, right, that are uh, now global, working all over the world. These country, companies have a, a very difficult time maintaining their competitiveness in their home country while their profitability is often led by their subsidiaries throughout the world. And so rather than taking what they know at home and pushing it out, which was the old kind of strategy, they're actually needing to be able to learn from what's going on in the periphery, how they're selling beer in China or how they're um, how Tesco is doing in Shanghai, for example, or in Korea, which is their most successful operation. Uh, so they need to leverage knowledge from the subsidiary back to the home in order to increase their profitability at home. A very different kind of uh, dynamic and trajectory of learning. There's a change of mindset from co-specialization then to co-learning. So learning from the periphery, learning together. Um, in disparate sites, including integrating structures and processes for mobilizing and sustaining a workforce that is global and local. So n not global or local, that's not the metric, but both at the same time. Um, small subcontractors may have very little global or multi multicultural knowledge, as in the Schlumberger example on an oil rig out in some remote area. And then as well as new objectives for companies, there's new demands for individuals. So the demands are that they need to partner and collaborate in teams where multiple stakeholders from ver varied cultural contexts are, are coming together with distinct technological knowledge. Again, like on the oil rig. So how does one do this and how did someone like Carlos Ghosn do this? And in part, the answer is uh, that he, rather than seeing cultural differences as something that is a liability, um, thinking of them as sources of friction and conflict, which is the general understanding of cultural differences, that someone has a different way of seeing how the world works and so therefore we're going to have difficulty working together. He sees this more as something that is a source of understanding and innovation and regeneration for the firm. So he sees cultural differences at Nissan Renault um, to see as a kind of germ for cross-fertilization in the organization. And so that this is, this is how he approached the Renault-Nissan alliance and by doing so he was able to respect the cultural differences and, and gain from the positives that they may have. So now, effective global leadership requires understanding, recognizing, and training for, and leveraging new cognitive and behavioral skills. What does that mean? So uh, this, is, this slide is a bit academic, but the new skills are that we, in order to be able to uh, capitalize on what others know and the different way in which they see the world, or the different way in which they see Tesco operations as being a, a service to their local community, we need to recognize that they have some kind of knowledge that might be valuable for the firm. So the first one is understanding, being able to recognize different knowledge. 
And this is not an easy thing. Let me just uh, give you an example. I, I just finished a uh, long, uh, longitudinal study of Tesco PLC where we trained nine of their subsidiary managers from Asia, from their six different uh, subsidiaries in Asia, to become insider, uh, what we call ethnographers, in, insider uh, participant observers of Tesco UK. And they came and they stayed in UK for three months in order to help Tesco UK understand what they might do better using what their subsidiary managers are doing in, in regards to the Tesco stores. Right? And in the, what we found, which was astounding, that out of the nine managers, so they're from Malaysia, Thailand, Korea, uh, Japan, India, and um, I've left one out, China, did I say China? Um, what was very astounding is out of these nine managers, the top three performers in terms of strategically doing the task that Tesco wanted, which was to help reinvigorate the UK core that was losing competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis Sainsbury and their competitors at home, the top three had three things in common. The first thing was that they had never left their home country before. That's kind of odd, right? They were not cosmopolitan. The second thing that they had in common is that their English language speaking ability was the poorest of the nine. In fact, the worst one of these managers in terms of being able to notice differences that mattered was someone who was bicultural, bilingual, who had gotten their MBA at Cranfield in England. She was the worst, and why? Because she didn't see the differences. She explained them the way, away. She would say, oh, well, th you know, th this is this, this is that. Or she thought she understood what people said. But the, the top performer, who was from Thailand, who spoke English very poorly, asked questions over and over again. Could you, especially in places like Newcastle or in Edinburgh, where, where it's even hard for a native English speaker to understand, she kept asking them to repeat themselves, you know? She didn't take anything for granted. So the most important thing here in terms of leveraging and uh, cultural, the, the, the uh, opportunities that different cultural viewpoints have is to notice that things are different. And cosmopolitans are, are people who uh, have, uh, and we teach a lot of these in, in France at INSEAD, one of the top business schools in the world, uh, we have a lot of cosmopolitans, you know, that have lived in so many different countries. And Europeans often are these kind of cosmopolitans because they go from country to country so easily. They, they think cultural dis differences don't matter because their survival depends on getting on the ground running in different cultures, right? And so what they do is they see things that recognize, they, they can recognize and help them out. So they see familiar things and run with it. Whereas what you want in terms of being able to reinvigorate the core of a company is to have people from the periphery come and see things that they don't understand, that are different. And in order to do that, you need to be an insider as, and at once an outsider. And many biculturals have this particular marginality that is quite valuable to organizations. They need to have deep cultural sensitivity and awareness and awareness means that you don't explain something away as if you already know it, right? And those scholars here know that that's a, a problem in, in educating younger scholars is that don't act like you know everything, you know, because the, the, the beauty and the, the deep recognition um, and constructs come from acting like you don't know something and starting there. So also having knowledge sharing capabilities, especially tacit knowledge. How do you, it, it, so language fluency isn't as important as, as being able to see the context as well as the content of the exchanges. So, um, and you need to do that with uh, ta being able to understand tacit knowledge. And we need a culturally nuanced, agile type of leadership, okay. And finally, to be able to, once you have the understanding, to be able to bridge and be able to take uh, your perceptions and be able to communicate them across the global footprint of the company itself. 
Uh, so you need a global mindset. And I, I might go quickly through a couple of these because I want to get to the, the meat. And I know that we have um, only 40 minutes or so if we want to have an active discussion. So the, basically, it, it, this, this kind of a global mindset requires really four different types of understanding. But uh, both for your own perspective, the insider us and the them perspective, so the periphery and the home. You need to really understand yourself and your relationship to your own context, but at the, understand, at the same time you have to understand others in relationship to their context. So you have to understand the forest and the trees in multiple contexts, not just your own. And many of us uh, spend a lot of time understanding where you're going or the other, but don't step back and understand that vis-a-vis your own context because we, unless we're really existential type people, which many biculturals are, and I'll get to that in a second, we don't sit and wonder and ask ourselves what is our culture. Culture is just something like a fish in water you take for granted until you're out of it or challenged by it. Right? And same thing for your environment. We have to understand your own organization and its relationship to its in immediate context as well as the others and the relationship with their context. And unless you can do that, you're not able to do that final knowledge sharing, bridging part that's important for these kind of people to bring to the organization. Unless you can do all four of these, you can't communicate back, you can't bridge. Do you see that? You have to be able to map yourself in your context, map the other in their context at different levels, not just at the individual level, but at the organizational level, and then be able to feed it back. And then not to mention power dynamics in organization and someone saying, well, I don't care about that. We're the home office. We're going to do it this way. So it's not an easy thing. At the same time of the new challenges, there's a new, uh, there's a cultural um, a complex cultural makeup of the global talent pool. So biculturals like Carlos Ghosn, who is actually a multicultural person, are becoming the new demographic. And nationality is less and less a cultural indicator. So as Rosalie said, I'm, I don't know if you said I'm American, but I am American. You, my parents were US born, um, but I was born and raised in Japan and lived there for the first 18 years of my life. So I don't look Japanese, um, but uh, Japanese, when they hear me speak Japanese, begin to say, well, maybe you are part Japanese. Your eyes kind of look Japanese, but I don't really have any Japanese blood in me. But you know, uh, they have to find it in order to justify that I can speak Japanese like that. Um, but anyway, so how we look is becoming less and less an indicator of whether or not we're multicultural. Right? And we all know people who look like they're bicultural, but they actually don't know the language of their parents, or they don't know the, the con cultural context that their parents came from. So such hybrids right, um, possess inherent skills that need to be recognized and understood, and especially leveraged. And what I'm saying is that organizations are a crucible, is, is first of all a location where people meet. These kind of people are uh, 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 abundant and it, it, there's many reasons why organizations should capitalize on this kind of knowledge. So biculturals and other cultural hybrids have deep knowledge of more than one cultural system, agile in moving from one cultural frame of reference to another, and can be boundary spanders. So just a bit on the new demographic, Canada, with the national policy of multiculturalism, is, um, sorry, 20 per, plus percent immigrant. Right? And of those immigrants, 25% are from Southeast Asian countries and 24% from Chinese countries. The US by 2020 will have the largest ethnic group. Um, the largest ethnic group in the US will be mixed race. In the Silicon Valley alone, 53.3% of the population is non-Caucasian right now. And, and they say that uh, Silicon Valley companies are either, uh, I, I think there's over 60% of the Silicon Valley high-tech companies have CEOs that are either Chinese or Southeast Asian, um, or both, you know. Uh, so, and they're also cross-fertilized by either Stanford or Berkeley or both, you know, so different organizational cultures. Uh, Singapore, lowest fertility rate in Asia, um, 
So this means that there's heavy pressures for even more multiculturalism in Singapore than they already have. Um, and the national policy is to go multicultural. The Gulf region, 70% expatriates, 17% Muslim, 3% Bedouin. And there's a parallel trend in Europe with low birth rates of the established population and increase in proportion of non-European born and second generation immigrants. So for example, in Spain, 50% foreign born in Madrid and Barcelona right now. Yeah, so it's huge. So all of this, the new demographics give new questions, both to scholars like myself, but also to organizations. So what's the nature of this new demographic? And, and I should say, what another interesting thing about this trend that we're finding, and I've been leading a global think tank on biculturals in organizations, is that in developed countries, uh, like Canada and US, the entering workforce is more and more bicultural or cultural hybrids, right? As I just showed you. But the top management teams are monocultural yet. And what's interesting in, in, in developing countries, we're seeing, it depends on the developing country, but many of the developed country is the reverse. So in India, for example, many of the top management have been educated abroad or Anglophile, have been, or even if they're educated in India, they've been educated in English, right? And so they're much more cosmopolitan than the entering workforce, for example. And in Mexico, the same. You get the same situation. In China, um, it's, there's, with the, the sea turtles and the seagulls and whatnot, you know, you, you have a, a mixture here. Um, so it, it's, it's harder to say. Um, and with Brazil, you have a country that's really still quite parochial, but historically was made up of multiculturals. Um, so it's a little bit different situation there. But it's interesting to think about if the trend in the new demographic of the entering workforce is predominantly cultural hybrids, but the top management is monocultural, then we have a lot of work to do in informing the top management um, that there is something that this new workforce has to offer beyond the traditional technical skills that they might be hired for. So who, what is this new demographic? What's the definition? What are the antecedents? Or do different, we know that different people become bicultural in different ways, so does this matter? Can we have a typology you know, of these? You know, and it, if we had a typology, what would we do? When, you, when you're hired for, from a company, when, would they say, what type of a bicultural are you? Not, you know, and uh, what kind of skill sets would you bring? What would that look like? So um, for example, there's universal versus specific characteristics. So some biculturals um, have a lot of knowledge of, of the cultural context in which they're bicultural. Some don't. Some have other kind of general cultural skills. For example, as I said, Carlos Ghosn knew nothing about Japan. So how was he so successful with Renault Nissan? You know, and so he has some kind of skill sets, cultural skill sets that are not culturally specific. They're cultural general skill sets. And so, you know, are you a Carlos Ghosn type of multicultural, right? Um, so do biculturals and individuals with multi multiple cultural identity have different skill sets than monoculturals. That's kind of like one of those research questions which is the science of the obvious. They've got to have different ones. But, but what are they? Cultural intelligence, cross-cultural adaptability skills, bridging skills. And what are the organizational implications? So job assignments. You know, could we, if we knew this, would we give people different types of jobs than just their technical jobs? About, how about training? Could could monoculturals learn what biculturals know? Uh, and how would you go about the training there? What are the policy implications? So uh, at the organizational level, at the country level, for example. So starting with the definition, what we've uh, uh, come up with is to think of biculturals as someone who has been deeply, who has deeply internalized more than one cultural schema meaning that they understand deeply that there's more than one way of organization, more than one way to live, more than one way to make sense of the basic questions that people have to make sense of when they're born into this world. You know, uh, I gave an example at lunch. My parents were missionaries in Japan. 
My dad was baptizing people in the Inland Sea. We were the only non-Japanese. And I kind of looked at my dad, looked at all the Japanese around me, and, and thought, there's no way he can baptize them all. And I can't believe they're all going to hell. So in my mind, I thought, well, God is good, but also so is Buddha. You know, it must be, that Buddha must be good as well, which to, to monocultural people, that would be a contradiction. But to me, it was a plurality that was all around me, and I understood. Um, so, and multiculturals are a variation on biculturals, meaning that they've internalized two or more cultures. And really, the, the research is showing that it's really more than three, then you become cosmopolitan. And um, there, there are good things about being cosmopolitan in that you're ad adaptable. You can go, get on the ground running in new contexts. You're likely not to have too much uh, emotional difficulty in going from country to country. But the, the negative side of too much cultural exposure is that you're no longer sensitive to cultural differences that matter, which is really quite interesting. So in, in other words, they're diminishing returns to cultural exposure um, in terms of uh, uh, leveraging knowledge from the periphery. So it, uh, a bicultural is distinct from first generation immigrants, right? Because it's some, someone who is innately born without a choice um, into this kind of situation. Um, and distinct from global cosmopolitans, as I've said. So here's one. Here's a, a bicultural type person, Ang Lee. We've all heard about him, right? He's someone who we, we would call a uh, integrated bicultural person, that he's integrated his two bicultural sides. Um, and here's an, ex uh, an artifact of that. So he's noted um, in Asia for having um, uh, produced some very successful Chinese movies, The Wedding Banquet and then Pushing Hands. But at the same time, he's very successful and producing and directing very, very Western, waspy, you know, uh, classics like Sense and Sensibility, for example. So someone who really um, leverages both sides of his bicultural identity. Um, in the psychological literature, and, and just a little bit of what we know here, they, we talk about there is a, a dynamic in multiculturalism uh, between the self and multiple cultural exposure. And I've talked a little bit about this, you know, diminishing returns to uh, cultural exposure. Now I'll talk just about biculturals, though. Um, there are some biculturals that we classify as going through a cool process where the multicultural, where you have a multicultural mind that acquires and represents multiple cultural knowledge, like Ang Lee, so in a very positive way. Cool processes mean that there's not a lot of conflict, that it's quite smooth, um, like a cool person. You know? um, so multi, uh, the, the cool processes result in multicultural exposures that enhance creativity. So there's work by Chi Ying Cheng, Fiona Lee. Um, Chi Ying Cheng's Taiwanese, Fiona Lee is Hong Kong Chinese, Angela Lung, Will Maddox, Adam Kalinsky, that have shown that people who have integrated their bicultural identity um, can utilize what they know effectively um, toward enhanced creativity for the organization. The facilitating factors of the cool processes is that they have a learning mindset, openness to experience. Some of the dampening factors are that they have high bicultural identity integration. So because they have I uh, integrated their bicultural identity, they tend not to see fracture points or difficulties or challenges that might be valuable. Um, and also there, there tends to be racial or ethnic essentialism um, among integrated biculturals, um, as opposed to understanding that there's a range of cultural identities and some are less comfortable than others. So they, they tend to say, I'm problematized by culturalism by saying, yeah, I'm Chinese Canadian and it's never been that big of a deal, you know. Um, now there, there's another side um, uh, to, let me see if I go back. So we saw Ang Lee. Now let's look at Frida Kahlo. 
a very different bicultural person. This is um, her, her uh, self-portrait on the borderline between Mexico and the United States. So very different parts of herself, if you look at this. You know? So you, you see um, the Mexico is represented as more organic, and which is on the left side of her. On the right side of her is the United States, which she sees as very mechanistic. And she, uh, you know, right around the time of World War, or the Mexican-US War, she was really much more uh, uh, a proponent of, of communism, wanting to share wealth um, to the poor people in Mexico and whatnot, and saw capitalism as, as something that really divided the rich and the poor. Um, so this is just, uh, and we could really analyze this, uh, this painting quite a bit, but you can see that this is someone who would have what I would call uh, cultural angst. So a, a lot of discomfort with her two cultural identities. Here's another one, Pasita Abad, racial identity crisis. You know, who am I? The one on the left or the one on the right? So these processes psychologists call hot processes of becoming bicultural or multicultural. And they're uh, associated with uh, low, uh, low bicultural identity integration. And this is associated with less benefits uh, from the bicultural exposure. At least the psychologists who are studying this are showing. And uh, an essentialism of race, ethnicity associated with difficulty in switching between cultures. The psych literature is showing. Uh, so on the one hand, you have the cool processes which lead to this multicultural mind of acquiring new knowledges, etc. And on the other side, you have the hot processes which are reacting to implications of the culture, of cultures and the self. So disintegrated biculturals often are feeling neither from here nor from there, not accepted here, not from there. So much, much more uh, difficulty in terms of understanding their identity. So the work that I'm doing currently with a few, uh, actually a graduate from uh, Simon Fraser, Stacy Fitzsimmons, um, and both uh, Mila and I were on her dissertation committee, is to understand from the organizational perspective, what about these hot processes of the um, biculturals and are they really not effective in organizations or is this a myth, right? So the psych literature is showing over and over again, they're, they're showing that if, unless you've integrated your, your, your bicultural identity, that you're more of a liability to an organization, right? And what we're kind of showing is, well, wait a second, not sure about that. And so we, we have, um, are, are doing quite a bit of studies, starting with just uh, conceptualization. So marginalized biculturals generally then are seen as poor performers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera because they're poorly adjusted. And finally, they, they're kind of schizophrenic, you know? And so they, ha they haven't rectified that. They should be on some kind of medication. You know? This is a general understanding. Um, and in fact, if we look at, this is um, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, um, um, but if we look at the, what he wrote about himself, the real Lawrence of Arabia, not this really good looking actor here, but he says in, in 1966 he wrote, in my case the efforts of these years to live in the dress of Arabs and imitate their mental foundation quitted me of my English self and let me look at the West and its conventions with new eyes. Well, that's a very positive thing if you're an organization. You want to look at places with new eyes. But for him personally, he said, they destroyed it all for me. At the same time, I could not sincerely take on the Arab skin. It was affectation only. Sometimes these selves would converge in the void, and then madness was very near. As I could not believe it would be near the man who could see things through the veils at once of two customs, two educations, two environment. So verging on the schizophrenia here, how difficult it was. So in terms of demystifying the myth, mar bar marginalized biculturals sometimes excel at global leaders. So for example, Carlos Ghosn. He, w he wasn't allowed to become, take the top position at Michelin. However, then he went and has become the single most famous 
alliance manager in the world, right? Um, in a country he knew nothing about, which is Japan. So global leaders, compared to domestic leadership, global leaders need heightened senses of diversity, complexity, and uncertainty. You know, those are kind of things that, that uh, people like uh, Lawrence of Arabia know a lot about, uncertainty, diversity, and complexity, because that's been the story of their lives, right? And what, what we're showing in our work is that there are boundary conditions, and, and also in rereading the psych literature in regards to marginalized bicultural. And there's two aspects here, mindfulness and individual agency. Um, and the, the, the literature in psychology says there are two types of marginals. Um, some that uh, are become a animistic, and yeah, they, they um, are, they split themselves like Lawrence of Arabia did and remain split. You know, I'm neither Arab nor English anymore. I can't identify with either one and remain at a certain heightened state of irritation about this, right? And others, um, and, and to the extent that you are aware of that, that's a good thing. You can mitigate the negative aspects of it. But to the extent that you're not aware of it, you can't mitigate the negative aspects. Let me give you an example from uh, some of our um, interviews of someone being mindful and someone not being mindful. So here's a mindful Indian American who says, I identify as a mixed, confused Oreo cookie. I have this one Indian friend who's straight from India, and he makes fun of me all the time. He doesn't see me as an Indian, and my white friends say I'm not like them because of my family or whatever. Then what the hell am I? Yeah. I sometimes wish that if I was going to be born Indian, I wish I was born in India. You know, that way, you know, it wouldn't be so complicated. So that's someone who's mindful of her hybridity. You know, she, she knows it, you know. On the other hand, here is uh, someone who is not mindful. So here is a Korean American interviewed, and she says, honestly, I don't think that there was much of a preference. It's no big deal. I'm comfortable either way. I guess I really just don't care. So someone like that might be suppressing things um, in order to fit in. And really, we, we can think that there's a lot of uh, antecedents that we have to think about. So when, what moment in time? are you bicultural and how are you bicultural? So for example, being bicultural Chinese Canadian in Vancouver at this point in time is not, a prob not so problematic, right? It might even be a good thing, right? But 100 years ago, it might have been much more problematic. And you might have been encouraged not to speak Chinese, whereas here you're encouraged to do so and also learn Mandarin. You know, and, and leverage that, right? So it really matters what point in time. But to be able to, to, to see both of your sides and understand the complexity of that is important in order to be able to leverage your understanding. But to not leverage, to not see and be mindful of it means that you become more monocultural and very, not very different from someone who's, who's fully monocultural. Do you see that? So it, 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 you, you need to be mindful of it, right? And the, the other side of this is, is um, the, the, the people who, are, who have created a sense of their own identity, individual identity, beyond uh, being either Chinese or Canadian, for example. Like when I first came to the United States to go to college, people called me an egg, white on the outside, yellow on the inside, right? So, okay, so that's kind of being, having existential angst. I, I'm, I'm not what I really look like kind of thing, right? Now I just say I'm a scrambled egg, you know? And so I'm much more of an individual. Um, I purposefully go by Mary Yoko so that people know that that's my complexity, right? And so the more people have understood the complexity and become, uh, created an individual identity, the more they're, even if they were marginal or are marginal, they can contribute what they know. Does that make sense? Yeah, so they're beginning to see these kinds of things. 
and so we, we have a working model for some of the more quantitative studies that we're doing, but and a kind of a guiding light for the qualitative studies. But you know, what are the antecedents? What what childhood behaviors? What you know? What are the demographics of of your biculturalness? You know, what countries are your bicultural in? What is the country the the cultural distance of the countries that you're bicultural in? I often thought, well, boy, if my parents had gone as missionaries to Spain, I would have fed in just fine. You know, it wouldn't have been that big of a deal. Um, but because Japan and the U.S. are so different, you know, that there's no way the Japanese would accept me as Japanese. We all know the Japanese don't accept very many people as Japanese anyway, unless they're Yokozuna and Sumo or something like this. But anyway, um, so your context, your background, and then this will lead to the type of bicultural you are. And then um, there'll be a moderator of your personality or individual differences or your age, you know. Uh, and then this will lead to different types of skill sets. How are we doing on time? Let's see. We're okay? So we'll talk a little bit about the skill sets. Ah, going quickly. Now this is from uh, David Thomas and the Center for Workforce Strategy, Strategy um, on cultural intelligence. But the idea that cultural intelligent, cultural intelligent behavior comes from cultural knowledge and skills and repertoire and it's mediated by what we call cultural metacognition. Let me tell you what these mean. So cultural knowledge can be domain specific. What do I know about China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, etc.? cetera? Um, so knowledge of cultural identity, values, attitudes, practices. Can be process knowledge, uh, knowledge of the effect of culture on one's own nature. Again, like that two by two, knowing about yourself in your own context and the nature of uh, cultural context and, and that you're operating in. So being reflective about who you are culturally and also what are the cultural dimensions of the context that you're in. You know, so being aware if you're in a global team, oh, that you know, this person comes from a high context culture, a, a culture like China, like Japan, like Lebanon, like Brazil, that pays a lot of attention to attending circumstances, not just the words, right? Um, and this is kind of the kind of knowledge that Carlos Ghosn had in terms of how he understood the Japanese. He didn't know Japan, but he himself says Japan was clearly a culture that was a bit like the Lebanese paying a lot of attention to hierarchy, paying a lot of attention to social status, paying a lot of attention to attenuating circumstances as opposed to just the words. So I'm going to use what I know of high context cultures when I'm in Japan. You know, I'm not going to be like the French. I'm going to be more leverage what I know about people who, where context matters more. Cross-cultural skills um, in particular that that are in, in, important in regards to cultural intelligence are perceptual acuity. That means going deep, being able to see the trees as well as the forest, you know, being able to understand the complexities. Empathy, being able to understand people from their own context, in their own context. Tolerance for ambiguity and being able to relate, so relational skills. Um, um, and it, that's closely related to empathy. Adaptability uh, and adaptability. So then cultural metacognition, I said, was a linking function between cultural intelligence and the knowledge. And it regulates cognition by bringing to mind relevant knowledge. So, Carlos Ghosn was able to bring to mind relevant knowledge that he had from his own upbringing that he could use in Japan. Nobody gave him a Japan 101 type course, but he was able to sense and leverage what he knew from other cultures. I've been asked to help with mergers and acquisition inter integration for, say, Daewoo Fiat. And I don't know Korea, and I don't know Italy. But I do know a lot about mergers and acquisitions, and I do know a lot about integration, cultural integration. And I was, I'm able to leverage what I know to be able to help out in that kind of situation. 
transfers knowledge from specific to broader principles. So not just the Chinese do, the Hong Kong Chinese do this, but um, high context cultures do this, right? So kind of frameworks as opposed to culture specific issues. And overcomes distractions of multiple tasks by focusing on cognitive resources. So um, metacognition means that you can focus more on the particular cultural aspects of what's going on. Compensates for individual lack of knowledge or skills. So again, if I can advise people on Daewoo Fiat to cu national cultures I don't know anything about. It's because I know a lot about culture. I felt it. I know what they're feeling. I can empathize with people that are going through cultural change. And, be and I can kind of glean what kind of culture they are from frameworks of different cultures, even without knowing and having lived in their culture. So we've been developing a new typology, and this might be fun for some of you who are bicultural to identify who you are here. Um, the, the typology is, 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 is through grounded theory of uh, content analysis of 312 narratives with biculturals collective over 10 years. And they are executives in the Silicon Valley, undergraduates in, in the Silicon Valley in Vancouver. Uh, Simon Fraser, actually. Participants in executive education programs at INSEAD and case studies of bicultural leaders. Uh, and so we have four basic types um, that we recognize with subtypes. One is what we call the one home bicultural. And so the one home bicultural is like the Korean American that I just read, right? The one that says uh, it's no big deal. Um, one home biculturals I identify more fully with one culture than the other. So you can have assimilated one homes, and assimilated one home would be like a Chinese Canadian who feels they're more Canadian than they're Chinese, right? You probably know many of these. Um, then there's the ethnic power bicultural, who's Chinese Canadian, but identifies much more with China or Hong Kong or whatever. Um, the ones in Holt that go in and speak Chinese, you know, or, or, or something like that. They, they act like they're in China or Hong Kong. Um, and then the fused are, uh, and I, I understand there are fused Hong Kong Chinese here who their parents don't really understand what they're talking about, but they have their own language that they speak and their own culture that they have. In New York, there are the Near Ricans, New York Puerto Ricans. Um, that speak a kind of Spanish that Puerto Ricans don't recognize as Puerto Rican Spanish. And um, English speakers wouldn't understand them, but they kind of have a subculture in New York and they're called Near Ricans, so kind of a fused. Um, but the, the, what they have in common is that they have one home, not a split home. The second type whoop, is the either or. And the either or are biculturals who alternatively identify with one or the other culture. Rosalie, you mentioned the Joy Luck Club. So the Joy Luck Club has this kind of either or. I, I don't know if you've seen the Joy Luck Club or read it, but there's a great, great example of a, Ch a Chinese uh, second or third generation Chinese, Chinese woman who brings her Caucasian boyfriend home to her mother's house for dinner. And uh, he, he makes a fool of himself. He pours soy sauce all over the best dish. And you know uh, he drinks way too much uh, of the rice wine, et cetera, et cetera. And you, you know, you, I kept sitting there thinking, well, why didn't his girlfriend help him out? You know, She's the bridge, but she's not the bridge, right? Because she, when she's with her parents, has become Cantonese, you know, Chinese. And she looks at her husband like some alien, her boyfriend like some alien Caucasian guy. Whereas when she's just with him in the residence of Vancouver, or maybe that was San Francisco, she, she's, uh, you know, she's being more American with him. But she has a very hard time um, bridging for him. And you know, she flunked the test of being a bridge. Um, and we probably know people like that, or maybe you're like that. I remember when I first came over to the U.S. and then I would go back 
with American friends to Japan, I felt that way. I was like, why are you walking on the tatami with your shoes on, you know? And then later I thought, why didn't I tell him not to? You know, I mean, that's, you know. Um, so because all of a sudden I'm, I'm like, I'm Japanese acting like I'm astounded at these people's behavior. So uh, then the other two types are the neither nor, um, which are biculturals who identify with both but don't feel accepted by either. So they're marginalized, right? And this is what I was growing up in Japan. Um, and it, this tends to happen with, with when your cultures that you're bicultural in are very different. Um, or if you're a refugee, political refugee, for example, and you can't go back. Um, and then the both ends are biculturals who identify with both and feel accepted by both and have blended. Um, more of the integrated biculturals. And just examples of the narratives. One home, I am Japanese American, but I don't speak Japanese and I've only been to Japan once and I felt like I was an embarrassment to my mother's family. Um, and neither nor, I am Korean, Dane, living in Sweden now, growing up in Denmark, I never felt Danish, though I speak Danish fluently. I've never been to Korea, but I feel Korean. I've always been told I'm Korean. Uh, both and I am Vietnamese and French. I know both cultures and I like to think I am a premium blend of both. Uh, either or, although I feel both German and Canadian, I feel more Canadian when I'm in Germany and I feel more German when I'm in Canada. It depends where, uh, where I am. Yeah, it's just a total mixture. Yeah. Okay, and the axes here that seem to be the important ones that are from social identity theory where that says that your identity is not just what you think you are, but it's whether or not your cultural groups that you identify with include you, if you feel included and accepted by the cultural group. So it's your relevant other's perception of if you belong to them, as well as your own perception about who you are. And so in some studies, preliminary studies we've done on these types, seeing what kind of skill sets the different types bring, if they bring different skill sets. Um, and these are just preliminary, but we found that, first of all, biculturals are different than, than monoculturals, which is the science of the obvious, but in terms of cultural metacognition, um, especially. Uh, and bicultural type, uh, and we did this now as well as when they were growing up. So for example, when I was growing up in Japan, I was what would, we would call a neither nor bicultural, I'm, I'm a blended both and now. But what we found out was but from these, these studies, and this is very significant, that it doesn't matter what you are now, it, it matters what you were growing up in terms of the skill sets, because you hone these skill sets then. Uh, so in terms of your bicultural type, now there's no differences, but bicultural type as a child, there were differences on cultural metacognition, adaptability, tolerance for uncertainty. And what we found is that both ends are higher in cultural specific knowledge, most effective in, at leveraging cultural specific bridging, whereas one homes were almost the same as monoculturals, um, but uh, they were strongest on personal autonomy because they know who they are, like the Korean Americans saying, it's no big deal, I know who I am, kind of thing. Either ors are highest on cultural metacognition and adapt adaptability, and neither nors are higher, higher higher on tolerance for uncertainty and perceptual acuity. And in fact, in, in some of our interviews um, in daycares, um, we found this uh, several times repeated by the daycare uh, teacher, that if they leave the room for a minute and they come back and they want to find out what was going on while they were gone, they would ask a neither nor bicultural. Because they've always been marginal all their life, so they're always trying to see what's going on socially so that they can fit in. So they're, you know, they, they report back, you know, well, so and so did this because of such and such a thing. And so they have a really good sense of what's going on. Those of you who work for a living, can you see how valuable this might be to organizations to have this, these kind of skill sets? Yeah. So they have hidden strengths, you know, they need, uh, neither. Uh, neither that they nor their employees know that they have. So they can be cultural brokers in language, behavior, and norms, not only spoken language but tacit language, their inherent bridging skills, survival skills, perceptual skills. Um, 
And so this leads to new initiatives for talent management. So you can use bicultural insiders to bridge and integrate across multinationals. So that's the example of the Tesco uh, PLC that I just gave. Um, have the lower level managers with deep knowledge of the local context, right, are able to help headquarters reinvigorate themselves with knowledge from the subsidiaries. So for example, the Korean, in Korean Tesco, um, there is a Tesco app for your smartphone. Why? Because in, te tes in Korea, Tesco joint ventured with Samsung, you know, so no brainer, create a Tesco app. Not only is there a Tesco app, but that app in Korea um, has a barcode scanner in it. And now in the metros in Korea, there's, there, um, while you're waiting for your train, there's a Tesco, um, what do you call it, panel, where you can scan your groceries with your Tesco app. And it, send, it, it orders your food choices. And by the time you get home, because most people have an hour and a half commute or something like that, your food is waiting for you. You know, So the UK Tesco, knowing this, could innovate something in the new UK uh, context to be able to be more competitive vis-a-vis -vis its competitors in the UK. So being able to have you know, even lower level managers say, well, we have this app. You know? Or, you know, we handle fish this way, you know, um, or we handle promotions this way. That might be valuable knowledge for Tesco at home to know and to help reinvigorate it. In fact, my colleague at INSEAD, Yves Dose, says the, the, the promise of the multinational is to be able to sense knowledge from the periphery and be able to meld it back into the organization and redeploy it effectively. Otherwise, if it's not doing that, if it's not leveraging knowledge from its global footprint, then local companies are always going to be much better at doing what they do because local companies already know the local context. So the promise of the multinational is to be able to sense, meld, and redeploy that knowledge. And so you need people that can bring that knowledge to you. So you need these dual organizational bridges. So in addition to organizational implications, there are public policy implications as well. And I don't know if we have public policy people here, but these are just musings on my part. But we have to take into account diversity of context. So um, if we think of Japan or Korea, um, the context is, is more closed as a society. Um, there's local language, and there's a fragile identity relationship with the rest of Asia, right? Um, until recently, in, I can speak of Japan more than Korea, but you know, even Koreans who had been in Japan for generations weren't given Japanese citizenship. Um, but um, about 25 years ago, this was possible. Um, but so much more closed. Um, there's, there's some countries that are more assimilative, uh, like France, China, Quebec, uh, and there's others that are more pluralistic, like the UK, Spain, and the rest of Canada. So where you have more of a global orientation toward language or languages within the country, st a stronger identity of the uh, different cultures. So more of what I, what I guess in Canada you call a mosaic. I like to call it a stew because I like food. But anyway, it's a chunky stew, you know, where the pieces of the stew are still visible. Um, and then vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States, which is a puree, a melting pot, and so you, you don't see the chunks in the stew. Uh, and then other countries that are more global, um, the UAE or Singapore, uh, where government provides a stronger source of identity than the country itself or the country um, countries themselves. Uh, aging monocultural po populations uh, are more common with this group and more cosmopolitan multicultural populations are more common with the other group. Uh, public policy continued. Um, it's important to think in terms of education. An example, India, Canada, multilingual, high commitment, innovation, part of the global network or a knowledge hub, hub. mindset, local with global awareness, so neither nor, but being both. Integration, but can one integrate without assimilating? 
um, national pride, you know, how does that work? So it's, it's unclear even here in the Canadian context. What is a common identity? What would be the common identity? Immigrants versus guest workers, different status of different types of people. How to adapt over time. Um, how to control discrimination. So like a hierarchy of Asians um, that we're seeing in different parts of the world. Uh, multicultural integration versus the juxtaposition of cultures. Um, so just some issues that there are out there. And what are the strategic implications for firms, multinational companies as a crucible where bicultural skills can be exercised and values? I really think this is like the, the forum um, that, that we can really kind of embrace and be able to um, help, uh, under, help an understanding of what are the skill sets and, and um, the opportunities we have with this new demographic. So uh, it's a context where local and global meet or intersect, most demanding of cross-context collaboration, subject to strong performance demand imperatives, strong selection environment, uh, having to overcome public suspicions in some parts of the world, so sometimes biculturals can help overcome that. Uh, biculturals as strategic resources provides awareness are there specific talents? Uh, are they recognized, ignored, repressed? These are just questions to ask your own organization. Training, how well do multinationals leverage and train bicultural mindsets? Uh, sorry, uh, my finger is trigger happy. And finally, innovation, more than bridges back to the home context, which many organizations already have. Um, they could be potential scouts and entrepreneurs in new third country contexts. In fact, there's some research being done by some young scholars, Chinese scholars, on the sea turtles, for example, in China, that are showing that you know, there, there's a high propensity of Chinese entrepreneurs coming from this sea turtle um, past that, that are very different um, from uh, just acting as a bridge, as, as you know, maybe their parents' generation of Hong Kong Chinese did, they're th much more entrepreneurial and much more uh, willing and able to leverage what they know um, for China entering Europe, for example, or for China entering other parts of the world. So that's, that's about it, and I wanted to leave time for questions. So thank you, and uh, open it up to questions. Um. On the second of the, uh, of the public policy slides, um, would the U.S. bonds be a similar or pluralistic? Um, well, you know, it, it depends on history, right? So I, I think it's, it's much, historically, it's been more assimilative, um, you know, especially around World War II, et cetera, et cetera. So Chinese coming to um, San Francisco then, so if, if, if you were raised at that moment in time, you likely don't speak Chinese. Right. Um, but now, if you're coming to San Francisco Bay Area, you're encouraged to continue to speak Chinese. So that's becoming a little bit more pluralistic, right? And also, it depends on what part of the United States. Um, yeah. Does that ring true for you? Yeah. yeah. So I think it's been assimilative. I think also after 9 11, perhaps there seems to be a reversal back uh, to the assimilative. Yeah, yeah. It's progressing when it That's a good point. Yeah, well, especially if you're from the Middle East. Yeah, so again, that'd be targeted to certain populations as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I work uh, primarily in the early stage innovation community, mm -hmm. um, mostly in Vancouver, but also in Boston and the Valley. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to your slide where you have the uh, perceptual acuity, ambiguity, those, those are the characteristics. Yeah, skill sets. Mm -hmm. The skill sets. Those are actually very similar to the skill sets we look for in early stage innovation teams. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, Spanning capabilities, right? Well, especially the high tolerance for ambiguity, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, emotional uh, steadiness, well, so yeah. More intellectual. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. But uh, so who, is it, are you or any of your colleagues doing work, not so much in, on the multinationals, mm -hmm. but in the early stage innovation, which is really what's the driver of economic growth today? That's interesting. Um, 
there's a, there are colleagues that are looking at entrepreneurship. Yeah. But this is really interesting because I've never really made the link between, uh, although, you know, if you just look at the demographics, you know, if you look at the people that are doing that kind of work, they tend to, you know, so uh, in, in the body of uh, data that we have, we have a lot of people doing this that are bicultural. So actually we could take that data and look at it that way. But I haven't thought about that before, but that's interesting. Uh, yeah. it, it jumped out at mm -hmm. that slide mm -hmm. that this, these are what we look for in early innovation teams. Is that's the skill set. Wow. Yeah, okay, that would be really cool. Good idea. In fact, I think we have some data we could just start looking at it in. Yeah. And then what would you do with it? Uh, well, um, yeah. I, I, I don't know if you follow the changes that are happening in um, early stage investment. Mm -hmm. We're at a transition point in early stage investment. Uh, I won't speak for outside of North America, but certainly in North America, the um, the current investment models are cracking mm -hmm. for complex reasons, which we'll go into now. But we, we need to um, cultivate an un well, actually, it's very similar to what, what you're saying. A lot of the angel investors mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, in and I know Boston and Vancouver better, so I'll just say Boston mm -hmm, and Vancouver mm -hmm. um, are much more likely to be uh, monoculturals. Interesting. But the, in, but the teams that we're financing mm -hmm. um, and the teams be are, are, are yeah. much more likely to be high, cultural hybrids. Right. So uh, I actually sort of consider myself a, a Japanese-Canadian cultural hybrid. Okay. Phase, um, and my children as well, mm -hmm. or our children. But um, if I look at the company that I, I just started recently, the um, there's Sikhs or from Hoover, mm -hmm. but they're culturally sort of Sikh British hybrids. Mm -hmm. There's another guy who actually is born and brought up in India and works in the valley. Mm -hmm. uh, there's Korean, mm -hmm. um, and then there's another one who's a she's Sikh Canadian, mm -hmm. um, and then Hong Kong Chinese Canadian. I mean, so I mean, these are the teams that are creating companies in Vancouver today. Yeah, interesting. And in the valley. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I know in the Valley, yeah. Cambridge yeah. Is, is a little bit more... Um, Monocultural. Yeah. yeah, I don't think that's fair, but compared, yeah. to, compared to Vancouver and yeah. yeah. the Valley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, so then the results of some of these studies are, are things that you could use in selling your organizations to your angel investors. Well, also, I think to yeah. educate the angels. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, Educate them as this is a selling point of your venture. Yeah, well, that, 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 yeah, good. Well, I'm glad you came to my talk. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank you for really a very complex type of study with mm. uh, many uh, parameters mm. uh, and variants to deal with. Uh, but my business is forming partnership uh, mostly in four, on, four, on four continents. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what I found was that when you talk about culture and acceptance, you know, uh, and so forth, those are really more on the superficial uh, interface. Mm -hmm. What we found is that there's something which I might miss in your presentation, is, is really the uh, ability to find common values. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, if we form a partnership and we don't have common values, mm -hmm. irrespective of whatever culture it is, mm -hmm. those are the closing. Yeah. Uh, the core is the value. Yeah. If we share the same value, what, what we need to do is that when I take a plane from uh, uh, Stockholm over to Hamburg, mm -hmm. I need to switch my thinking because my German friends will react differently mm -hmm. than my Swedish friend would. Mm -hmm. uh, so to some degree is the communication has to be adaptable to the cultural outlook mm -hmm. uh, of the theme. But without the core value being shared the same, then there's no real partnership involved. That's right, yeah. And, yeah. and conflict will emerge uh, fairly quickly. Along the way. Yeah. So, so I think when you mentioned about a, a multicultural exposure, uh, and of course in Canada we have a, in Vancouver we have lots of cultures here, mm. uh, but very often we find that we could not use somebody to help us 
to bridge to the other society, mostly because we don't share the same value. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's interesting that you say this. Um, in, in an interview that, that's um, going to be coming out um, in the Academy of Management Learning and Education Journal um, that um, Gunter Stahl and I did of Carlos Ghosn, we talked to him about uh, how he handled exactly what you're talking about with Nissan and Renault. And what he said um, is, is, is that you have to have that common ground. Um, when, when you're working in an organization um, where you have disparate cultural values. Um, however, you don't have to have a merged culture. You don't have to merge the French and the Japanese and the Nissan cultural mindset and the Renault cultural mindset completely. You just have to understand what, why are you having this merger for? Why are you together to do what tasks? And then you bound your common values. You say, okay, we're going to, on the aspects that we're working together, making a new car for, to launch to the European Union, we have to agree to value quality, value design, value, you know, that we are, are agreeing on a common ground. But on the other aspects of whether you stay beyond five o'clock and work until your boss has gone home in Japan and whether we go home right at five o'clock in France, we can keep those separately. You know, so bounding the places where you uh, negotiate change in culture for common ground is very, very important. So respecting the differences and then coming up with a common shared value on the aspects that are directly connected to the issues of your business is what's important. And these are not an easy thing to do, but it takes uh, guidance. It takes a leader who can bound it and bound where you go, where, where you have to come up with common ground and where you leave each other alone to be who they are. I think that's, I think Canada is ahead of the cue ball in terms of using the term multiculturalism and thinking of it more as a mosaic or a stew, you know, because there has to be the liquid that holds people together, yet there can be chunks of difference that are respected. Struggling a lot it's got to be a struggle, in yeah. Canada, yeah. That, uh, many of our large companies uh, are having difficulties trying to grow globally. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that we have mm -hmm. all the uh, mosaic uh, of allowing to do so, and part of it may also be uh, first there's a value issue, mm -hmm. but the other part is that many there are not enough Canadian students mm -hmm. studying ab abroad. Mm -hmm. uh, so with 70,000 Chinese students study in Canada, mm -hmm. and we got 4,000 Canadians in China, mm -hmm. and 3,000 of them are there to teach. Mm -hmm. Uh, English is the second language. Mm -hmm. So in essence, a ratio of 70 to 1. Mm -hmm. And so now the Chinese can have a senior executive coming back with CNOC mm -hmm. to take over an accent, mm -hmm. feeling very comfortable with Canada because mm -hmm. they have spent four years mm -hmm. or five years, whatever, in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. But for a Canadian to be going into China to take over a major Chinese company, mm -hmm. it would feel very far. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure, yeah. And, and so that is really one we are, where we're struggling very much in Canada right now, is to try to have enough Canadian students to go overseas, mm -hmm. to get that, that level of comfort mm -hmm. in order to be able to manage that global conflict. Well, that's great. Yeah, I, I think we have our work cut out for us. Yeah. That's, that's interesting, too, because uh, today we have more Canadians and more Americans studying Chinese and Japanese, for example, mm -hmm. than any time in past history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. intercultural communication has been integrated more and more into language instruction mm -hmm. nowadays. So you, you can't help but wonder when will we start seeing the results. Mm -hmm. well, I think with most the students studying the Chinese, uh, like I think I understand in Edmonton, there are 14 uh, Mandarin uh, uh, immersion uh, schools. Mm -hmm. In Vancouver, we have one, yeah. uh, despite the fact we have a much larger Chinese population. Yeah. I think for those who have had the exposure, will feel much more, it will be a small step 
for them to go over and take an MBA in Peking University, yeah. and then all of a sudden start to realize that not only uh, you can adjust to the cultural, what I call peripherals, mm -hmm. that you, know, you, know, you never say no, uh, you're saying no, mm -hmm. you don't say no. So all of the hundred ways of saying no without saying no. So those are elements which will allow them to do that. But more importantly is for them to then be able to understand how the society over in China works, okay? how the society in Japan actually works, and so that when we build companies and form organizations, then we are confident that we now we can uh, grow into those those uh, uh, communities uh, and, and, and thrive and grow. And I think the challenge for organization is to 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 recognize that with the individual talent what they bring. So there's, there's some students who do speak Chinese fluently, you know, but still aren't, aren't trusted to, to really know China. You know, okay, you speak it, but you, you don't really understand China or et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I, I think that we have a, uh, what am I trying to say? It would be nice if it was more balanced, if there were more Canadians who spoke Chinese and understood China, but that in and of itself wouldn't be the panacea. That wouldn't solve these issues. What, what's important is for us to um, understand that people, there are different kinds of skill sets that different kinds of people have and appreciate those and leverage them, I think. I think part of the problem that we've had in Canada historically is the one that you identified that you know, in most Canadian companies, not all, this is changing, but in most companies the boards are um, still fairly monocultural. Mm -hmm. Now that's changing, but it, I think if you did a study of public company boards in Canada, you would find that they are um, primarily composed of modeling mm -hmm. Actually, let's face it, they're, they're mostly white males in their 50s to 70s. Yeah, well, it's interesting because the, the, the work on global teams and on diversity shows that it, so, so diversity in and of itself is not necessarily a good thing because it could cause conflict, that there might not be shared values, et cetera, et cetera. But when the task at hand reflects that the need for that diversity, like global multinational organizations, then you want the board to be more diverse. Right, so we should just send them some of our research on global teams and diversity, because <laughs> it, it would say that you, you need a board that's more diverse. Well, the, the optimistic part of me thinks that this is changing over time. Yeah. But I'm not sure if there's any real data that shows that that's true. Yeah, I don't know. I, but th there might be some studies that show the composition of the board changing, but it probably shows that it's changing a lot slower than it should, <laughs> Yeah, would be my guess. <laughs> Certainly, the gender diversity work has done so. Looking into your study of this presentation to see if there, in fact, there is a framework which I think we can ask our government policy makers mm -hmm. uh, to use, mm -hmm. so that we can turn the mosaic culture of Canada into a commercial strength, uh, which we are not yet. You know, we we yeah. have all the ingredients, but mm -hmm. we don't know how to put them together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 they're pieces of it. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, two things. When you, you mentioned the term, uh, which made me think of it, and you mentioned boundary once or twice, there's a whole field of um, uh, th uh, theoretical <laughs> studies now called boundary theory. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah. And I have found that really most, most useful in yeah. trying to understand things from individuals to family mm -hmm. dynamics mm -hmm. to institutional, uh, educational institutional right. dynamics to corporate uh, dynamics and um, the most of the difficulties in cross-cultural communication come from thick boundaries mm -hmm. um, and most institutions will have thick boundaries mm -hmm. because that's how institutions evolve as boundaries are recognized and so forth. One of the difficulties for example in uh, institutions of higher learning now uh, is getting the acceptance of interdisciplinary studies because right. the disciplines have very boundaries. boundaries. And sometimes a young faculty member who has seen the light and they realize that you can't really, well something like Asian studies mm -hmm. is essentially 
in, in essence, it has to be interdisciplinary because you can't, it's an artificial distinction to separate philosophy from politics, from mm -hmm. uh, eco economics, and or management. religion, and so on, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's one. So I, I think the, uh, uh, for, uh, for a healthy evolution of systems to occur, mm -hmm. there has to be, um, there has to be not just this thick boundary core, mm -hmm. which can be, you use the term, reinvigorated mm -hmm. by uh, the, the application of, marginal, of some marginality. Right. Uh, but marginality has to be incorporated. In order for that to happen, marginality has to be incorporated within the system. So mm -hmm. you could say that, for example, the core values uh, can have thick boundaries around them, as, for example, uh, you, you use the, um, uh, the example, was it Nissan? Yeah, in, Nissan, in, Renault. In Nissan yeah. in Japan, mm -hmm. uh, for the core. but to be surrounded by, or to have incorporated within the large system. Right, uh, like cross-fertilization. Uh, thinner boundary institutions, yeah. that's what yeah. it is. The other thing was, you mentioned the importance of childhood uh, context, mm -hmm. and uh, that made me think of something when I was in communication at SFU uh, several years ago, something called, a field called symbolic interactionism, mm -hmm. uh, in which the, the, the almost everything is reducible to this is how I see you seeing me. Mm -hmm. Right, right, perception. And yeah. I thought about that, my God. <laughs> you know, it, it, I can understand now how mm -hmm. some little child whose parents, you, you, when, when that child is looking up into the eyes of mm -hmm. mommy and daddy and mm -hmm. sees somebody looking at them as if to say, I'm looking at the next premier. Well, exactly. <laughs> I'm looking at yeah. the next yeah. prime minister yeah. or something. That child sees yeah. themselves yeah. as the object of that kind of expectation right. and wants to grow into it. I think uh, that has to do with that has to do with boundary formation and mm -hmm. boundary evolution. Right, and, and just culture. You know, that, that that's that's culture, you know, what, what you're taught uh, about the way the world works and how what how you fit into that. Mm -hmm. You know. And so I guess my point is that there are people who have been socialized in more than one of these and they can be boundary spanners. Mm -hmm. And um, if we could realize that, uh, first of all, recognize that, understand that, and, and help in the organizational crucible, help them leverage that, you know, then we not only went out as, as organizations in terms of having this knowledge, but actually we're, we're offering a clinical solution to individuals who would otherwise be like Frida Kahlo or these disjointed marginals who are somewhat schizophrenic but understand um, that actually they can be more integrated. So thank you very much. This time is up. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks to Professor Brennan for a thought-provoking and interdisciplinary discussion. Thanks. And obviously we've gone over time, so it must have been oh, really caught no. attention. Oh, and, thank uh, you. It's a very interesting discussion. Very interesting. Thank you also to Professor Rosalie for continuing to support the forum and bringing such great speakers. And thank you to uh, Edith Lowe, the administrator of the Lab Center, for her work in helping to facilitate today. Thank you. So, um, and thank you all for coming and contributing to a very interesting uh, subject for this session. Um, I will put in a couple of plugs. Um, I think we have something like six or seven events upcoming in the Lab Center. Intercultural communication, of course, uh, includes other media, uh, art, music, literature, and so on. And uh, so we have uh, regular events open to the public that, that look at those as well, as well as discussions of history, philosophy, religion, and so on. Um, so it's very diverse, very interdisciplinary, and, and wide open to public participation. So go to our website. Just Google David Lamb Center. It'll come up. It's always the first thing on the list. <laughs> I don't know how we did that. <laughs> and uh, you'll see our events there. And you're more than welcome to come. Uh, and uh, once again, thank you, uh, oh, Professor Brennan, thank for you. a lively uh, discussion during lunch, too. That was oh. most interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I'll pull these things out before I forget. Oh, yeah.